Hello, hello, hello. This is L Army. Welcome to Hippie in the City. In today's episode, we have a panel of female founders. They are strong, independent, kind, and open. Michelle Larravee is a Scorpio, Georgetown alum, and former investment banker who had a ski accident a few years ago, and the only thing that helped her chronic pain was acupuncture. Through this healing journey, she met Dr. Sherry Auth, our second panelist. She is a Virgo, doctor of Chinese medicine, and a board-certified herbalist and licensed acupuncturist. Together, they started Within Acupuncture Studio in Flatiron, and they're bringing these ancient healing practices to the modern world in an accessible, fun, and affordable way. Our third panelist, Katie Sands, is also a Scorpio. She's a style expert, lifestyle blogger, and a New York City native. You can find her on Instagram at HonestlyKate or her blog, which is IamHonestlyKate.com. She is so open and honest about how difficult it can be to start your own business as well as being the face of it. Her ambition and smile are gorgeous. She has an exciting new project in the works with Amazon. I can't wait to check it out. Please love Michelle, Sherry, and Katie. So here we have um, Michelle and Sherry, who are co-founders of Within Acupuncture Studio in Flatiron, and then Katie Sands, who is um, a style expert, and um, her handle is Honestly Kate, and she is fabulous. <laughs> um, okay, so my um, first question for all three of you, what inspired you to start your companies, your businesses that you run? I can start. Mm-hmm. So just taking a step back within is, as Elle mentioned, um, we're modernizing acupuncture in Chinese medicine. And so we have retail acupuncture studios where we do acupuncture treatments as well as cupping. And then we also have our own line of Chinese herbal medicine that's available in the studio as well as online. And our whole mission is about accessibility for all. And so how do we demystify and bring these time-tested, very powerful healing modalities to a much larger audience. Um, And the inspiration for me, and I think it'll be cool to also hear Sherry's perspective because we came at it from kind of both sides of the spectrum, Um, but my experience was my own personal health transformation. And so about five years ago, I had a ski accident and ended up with dislocated vertebrae in my neck and a fracture in my back. And was left in a cycle of chronic pain. I was trying physical therapy and kind of every other modality, muscle relaxers available um, in Western medicine. And eventually my doctor suggested acupuncture. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Getting weird. (laughs) Um, And when he suggested acupuncture, this was five years ago. And I feel like, you know, it was kind of much more in the shadows than it is now. Um, And but I was willing to try anything in a situation Mm -hmm. of chronic pain, started doing acupuncture. Pain relief was amazing and immediate, which was really encouraging. But as I was going on a regular basis, what was really exciting to me was that I was less stressed. I was sleeping better this time of year when kind of everyone around is getting sick. I felt like I had... Pressing on my ear crystal. Press on your ear (laughs) seeds, everybody. Um, (laughs) Felt like I had an immunity force field around me, if you want to talk about, you know, getting out there. Um, The metaphysics. And and then a couple years later, acupuncture and herbs also helped me get pregnant with my son. So, (laughs) Sam. Um, I'm looking at you, Scott Army. (laughs) (laughs) Um... So it fundamentally transformed my life, but then as a consumer, it was getting expensive, it was hard to get an appointment, the experience was, you know, random location, smelled like weed, just very not elevated. Um, And kind of as a consumer of SoulCycle and Dry Bar and modern other wellness concepts, I really couldn't understand why something that was so transformative and so powerful was so hard for people to access. Um, And so for me, that was really, the way that I came to Within and what inspired me was how can I bring these healing powers to more people? Do you agree, Sherry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, agree. I definitely agree that it's transformative. Um, so Michelle and I met about three years ago. 
something like that. And because um, Michelle Javian introduced us, who is a client of Sherry's. Yeah. And um, so uh, a little bit of my background, I'm Dr. Sherry Oss, so I have a doctorate in Chinese medicine. And so I'm a licensed acupuncturist and a board certified Chinese herbalist. Uh, I just always wanted to help people. And uh, for me, I really found that mind-body medicine was the best way to do that. So I studied all over the world. I'm when also you certified. you say mind-body medicine, yeah. what do you mean? Can you explain that? Mind body medicine recognizes that our emotions have physical impact on our health. And there's no separation mm -hmm. between the two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really at within one of the primary things that we treat is stress because acupuncture lowers your cortisol levels and increases your serotonin and dopamine levels. And also it's really like a party. Yeah, <laughs> we actually have two nervous systems. So we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight. We spend a lot of time in that nervous system. Deadlines, trying to get somewhere. You know, the blood is rushing to our brains. It's rushing to our muscles. We're in go mode. And what acupuncture helps to do is really shift us into our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest nervous system. Blood goes to the stomach. We digest better, we relax, our bodies are allowed that time to heal itself. So this is what mind body medicine is. Um, you also have such a relaxing energy. <laughs> I'm like I'm in acupuncture yeah. now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, I just, I've always felt called to help people. You know, I'm really a, a born healer. And so for me, my inspiration of opening within is to have greater impact. Mm -hmm. You know, we now have 18 acupuncturists that work for us. We've given over 5,000 people their first acupuncture treatments in the last year. This is so exciting to me. Um, so for me, I just really want to make it more accessible. Uh, we cut the price of acupuncture in half for New York City s to help democratize it. Um, we're spreading the word on how it works, why you would get it, simple things that it doesn't hurt. You know, um, definitely a marketing challenge there to say like, hey, we're gonna stick 25 needles in you and like, it's gonna feel and great. Gonna you feel might fall asleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but we're doing it. it, we're doing it. And, um, and it's super exciting and amazing. Yep, and we have 35 AccuBabies and counting, Ooh. meaning women that we've helped with fertility support. Are you serious? The journey. Yeah. That's so, that's wild. Yeah. No, like that's major, I think, right? Sign me up. That's why we exist. Years. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you guys have done such a great job. I know I've been going to acupuncture my whole life, but it wasn't until you guys opened within that I got to, I convinced my friends and family to actually go to acupuncture because I think other acupuncture, uh, at a studio, uh, I don't know what they're studio. called, offices, studios, yeah. um, we're just some more intimidating. And I think that you guys, it's you walk in and it's not dark, it's very open and bright and it's very welcoming to your experience. So I think you're, I think it's gonna be major. Thank <laughs> you. Um, the question was, what? how did we get into this? Yeah, what inspired what, you to start your own business? Business. Um, I've always had a really entrepreneurial spirit. Like you, I was also acting and doing theater before I started my blog. And at the time, I was in grad school for theater production. So sound design, lighting design, costume design. I kind of wanted to be in the background of it, but still in the theater world. And I was shadowing a few costume designers at the time as like my internship for the program. And I started posting pic literally mirror selfies on Instagram, which I thought was an editing tool. I wasn't using it as like a social platform of the outfits to keep track of the looks. And I was putting them on myself so I knew what they would look like on the different actors. And my following started growing from that. And people, different brands started following and reaching out. And then once I realized that I could really monetize the company and it could be a small business that I had while I was in my grad program, I went full throttle. I started putting on like my business hat and sending emails and pitches to every single brand and fashion and beauty brand I loved and saying, hey, I love, I love Rag and Bone. I wear your jeans all the time. You should send them to me and I'll shoot them. And they'd just like be like, no, flat out. <laughs> I'm like, that's not how this industry works. So then I started doing more research into the blogosphere and the digital marketing industry in general. And I kept up with the emails, I kept emailing, and as my followers count started growing and I had um, a little more ground 
to show off. It just sort of took off more organically. And I think I wasn't, I, I wasn't trying at first for it to be a full-time position. So I wasn't worried about the money aspect as mm-hmm. much. And I think that really helped because I didn't put as much pressure on it. Right. And I was doing, thirsty. yeah, I wasn't being thirsty and I was just, it was really fun. And I yeah. loved engaging with uh, most of my followers, um, are young women and I loved giving advice and I've always done that my whole life. So I think, um, it just kind of melded together. And then once the, the blogosphere started, um, showing that this was going to be a real promising industry, then it was not until then I started like hearing from different brands that I was originally reaching out to and I just went with it. And I here feel like we are. Everybody's dream. Just like, oh, a lot of no, followers no. happen to but follow me. But the lot of followers like, didn't teach happen. Teach me your tricks, Kate. No, no, no. The lot of followers didn't happen at all in the beginning. Like that, that, would, and it's still been like a slow growing journey. Yeah. And I think people always are like, how do I add, get more followers? I'm like, it'll happen every, uh, th- I've been doing it now almost three years. Like it didn't just happen overnight. I right. wish it did. But like, of course, now that more people are following, they they think this happens just, so fast. Yes, and I'm like, course. no, no, no. Like I had 10 followers and I was like begging brands to send me clothes. And they were like, absolutely Pretty not. Sure. That's not what, how this works. Yeah. Did you, um, how important do you think a media kit is? Or like um, a, having a... I think having like a one page or media kit is mm-hmm. important in any industry. I think something to show your background and show different examples of projects you've worked on is really important for someone to get to know you better if they really know nothing about your company or your brand. I created a media kit that I would send everyone. Um, now I think it gets a little trickier because of the digital space. Everything is open access people don't really ask me for a media kit as much as they'll say, hey, can you actually send a screenshot of your analytics? Mm. So you can't even make it up. It's not like a resume anymore where you could kind of like put something over here, yeah, like yeah. put fluff something it, over, fluff like, it up. Oh, I have to literally send a screenshot of like time stamped of my analytics for mm. the time. So I think the world is changing a little. I mean, I guess it's for the better because it will weed out people, I guess, that we're inflating the books in some ways, mm-hmm. but in other ways, it's kind of a pressure cooker because then you really have to show like direct, it's all a numbers game now. Right, and then you have to keep up with the yes. communication and the- Yes, and in, and, and like everyone going. knows, like my main platform is Instagram, but I also have my blog, which I think is important for any business. If you are putting yourself there on social channels, it's so important that you also own your own website because you don't own what's on any Mm. social channel, they own it. Mm. So it could go away tomorrow. And like you see every day, the algorithm on every social channel goes, fluctuates tremendously. And I think that you, you can't rely on it. Like it definitely could disappear. And if you don't have your content somewhere else and you're not actively working on your own work, I think it could, it could be really negative. Yeah. Mm. And so to use it more as um, just a marketing tool. Exactly. Instead of the whole... Like use it as business. your press. That's what yeah. I always tell people. I'm like, this is like my press page, but then there's so much more that goes into it. And if you want longer posts or more in-depth content, like this is my website. Right. Cool. Very cool. Um, do you feel, um, this is also for all three of you, do you feel that being women has its pitfalls or what um, are some examples that you've come across where you felt like you weren't maybe getting as much um, of a platform as you should for if or anything like that any stuff about feeling like being a female CEO boss entrepreneur has been a hurdle I'll let you start. Oh, sure. I, I think there's never been a better time to be a woman. Um, I, I can't even believe what's happening. It's it's so exciting. And, you know, Michelle and I did a seed round, and I just was <coughs> blown away by the amount of support there is now for female entrepreneurs. So I love that. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Go for it. <laughs> That's good. Michelle? 
Yeah, I definitely agree that times are changing. I think it's also really different in the wellness world specifically, where sure. you know females are our customer, they're first adopters, mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like we have a really strong community around us. Mm -hmm. I always say that kind of like the most important thing for me on the entrepreneurial journey is the support network that I've built in different mm -hmm. ways, and you know, starting with having a really strong husband and partner to a great female co-founder mm -hmm. to um, you know a business coach but I think the community that we've built of our team who are lots of female founders as yeah. well as a lot of our clients building your our, tribe yeah exactly some of our investors are Elizabeth Cutler and Julie Rice from SoulCycle who are you know trailblazing female entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and they started um, you know in the early 2000s right. when it was a lot harder to be a female yeah, founder Wild so West. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of different resources that are available to us now, which is yeah. really exciting. And we're in New York City too, so you mm -hmm. have it's like yeah, good for everybody. Yeah. Um, what about you, Katie? Um, I haven't found any downfalls of being a woman. I actually I'm like so inspired by the different women I meet, and I like anytime I hear a new entrepreneur or solopreneur story, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so motivated to do more. Mm -hmm. What I have found like downfalls in is kind of being the talent or the face of your brand mm. because I think it's really hard when you're selling a brand that is yourself to negotiate for yourself um, and kind of push mm. yourself and I think like being a business person and also being a creative can really yeah. um, be hard mm -hmm. and I found that in a lot of ways um, people I was working with in the past were, were like, oh, well, you should just, you you are you are the face, so just act like dumb and like you don't know what's happening and just like act super nice mm -hmm. and we'll take care of like the heavy hitting in the back. Yeah. Um, but then I just realized that that's not, that didn't really fly with me. And if there's someone I'm gonna wanna work with, they're gonna have to be able to work out problems and um, like take constructive criticism and you're not always going to be like the happy person yeah. that you're that you might look like or post and that yeah that's been that the most difficult part myself too like mm -hmm. that being a really happy-go-lucky bubbly person and then also with modeling and acting and things like that that when you I've also found in this podcast um, world and creating this brand that people are su surprised when you're, you know, tougher or when you just have really strict standards. And it's, it, I haven't found a good balance for that yet. Mm -hmm. I'm like either like, no, give it to me now. Or I'm like, hey, how are you? What's up? And I'm like, feel like I'm a little Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Yeah. Hyde. Um, and I, I find that it's a bit of a struggle because I've also been, had a really entrepreneurial spirit my whole life. And taking something and making it bigger than just, you know, like a lemonade stand or, you know, mm -hmm. an Etsy shop or something like that um, has been challenging in marrying those two parts of myself. Yeah. So I, I resonate with that a lot. Um, so that leads me to my next question, which is um, when you get no's, our least favorite word. Um, how do you keep going? How what inspires you to just push forward the thing that you believe in so much? Because I find that all entrepreneurs um, and artists and creatives and wellness people, it's like it's something you have to do in your soul. That you, it's like you birthed a child and you have to see it out into the world so when people um say no to you like when you were saying with the um rag and bone mm -hmm. or anyone that's just sort of like you know not right now um what inspires you to keep going what keeps your spirits up go ahead oh i'll take well i like i honestly think the word no is I try to look at it from the opposite way and I always whenever I try to give someone advice I'm like what's the worst they're gonna say no like it's really not that big a deal if someone says no to you yeah. and I think so many of us kill an opportunity to reach out to somebody or to work with someone because we're so afraid they're gonna say no but if they do it's okay it's like you didn't you have You're nothing like to lose at that point that you yeah you before. were in the same spot yeah. you were yeah. before so I always say to people I'm like just reach out like the worst they're ever gonna say is no 
like they can, they're not going to be like no because you're hideous like they're just going to say no um <laughs> and I think anytime I've heard no it's only made me want to prove that much more that I, I they should be wanting to work with me because of x y and z or if I didn't get um a partnership I want and I see someone else did I'm like okay maybe I can look into myself and what are what's that person doing that that brand would want to work with them and you kind of do like a case study mm. in that kind of way and realize that you're always going to be growing once when you're starting your own business and it's okay if people are saying no because that just means you have more room to grow that's good I feel like some of our biggest no's came when Michelle and I were raising our seed round. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we did, what, like 75 pitches or something oh, like, like that. Oh, like 175. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a numbers game, you yeah. know? And you just have to keep going. And the passion has to be greater than the fear, mm. you know? So the passion just, like, helps you to persevere. Mm-hmm. Um and I kind of equated a little bit to dating. Like, I feel like I really conquered <laughs> dating when I got really good at rejection. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like somebody can tell you no, but you're not turning on yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you believe in yourself. Yeah. Okay, it's not you. Next one. Yeah. Next. Yeah. You know? Next. Not Keep going. You. It anyway. was their problem. Like <laughs> they had a problem. Getting. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree with the passion. Like it has to, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your idea. Mm -hmm. You have to just like live it, breathe it. I think there was also something where like I was completely convinced that like this was going to be a huge idea and I would be so pissed if it was someone else that made it Mm -hmm. happen. So I would remind myself of that also. And then I think also like Sherry and I were a really great support system for each other during that time. Because I definitely remember there are days when I was just like, it's over. It's just not going to happen. Like, we're done. And she'd be like, are you crazy? Like, no, like, keep, we're going to do this. And there'd be other days where it'd be like kind of the opposite, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could always just see it. So Mm -hmm. I just knew it was real. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, okay, you can feel that way for today. But tomorrow, we're back on the horse, sister. Right. Yeah, (laughs) that's good. No, it's definitely good to have a support system and beautiful people that are all supporting you to keep going because it's I find that it's really hard sometimes when you are wearing your business hat and you're doing so many of the tasks that it takes to get there and then I sometimes just get stuck in my head because I've been there all day and in my laptop you know and I'm like I need to just call somebody to pull me out of this funk and just remind myself how important it is to me to talk about these things and make it a more normal thing to, you know, go like, you're not going to feel amazing every day when you're doing this. And that's not the goal. Like, that's not the point. It's like that you just believe in it so much that you have to get it out there. It's like a part of you. Um, okay. I have my next. Oh, Okay, (laughs) so um, before we really get into the the heart and the soul, oh, that's cotton. Um, Okay, I want you guys to spill the tea on how hard it is to make money when you're first starting. Is it really, really hard? I'll start. No, yeah, it's really hard. I think people if I for me at least I can't speak to anyone else's brand but I remember when I was first starting and these big name brands started reaching out to me that I was really excited about but were asking me to do things for free Mm -hmm. and I had to make a decision then and there do I want this to become something bigger and do I how am how am I going to use it because you don't want to say yes and then resent the brand Mm -hmm for doing it when you're the one who agreed to the partnership. And I think you kind of have to establish that early on because when anyone starts out in any industry, you're doing a lot for free to prove yourself, whether that's an internship or taking a class on the industry. Um, You need to use it kind of as, for me, I used it as press. So I would negotiate with the different brands and say, okay, um, 
I'll post in this outfit or I'll talk about your beauty product in exchange for you can repost the image on your page. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to use it as free marketing and press for me since I never worked with a publicist. Mm -hmm. And in return, they would post it and then I would be extremely happy with the brand. So I never, you never want to get it you never want to get to a point in your job where you become resentful of someone you're working you're with. you're giving away more That than, you're giving away yeah. um, yourself or they're taking advantage. And I think if you just set the precedent early on what you expect for them in exchange and instead of saying that um, you're doing it for free, saying you're doing it in, you're doing it in exchange or you're doing a trade. And um, it's really difficult. And I think especially if you don't have something else you're doing at the same time, if you're not working a second job or you're not in school or you just don't have the luxury to only Mm -hmm. depend on one thing for um, your income, I think it can be really challenging. I always tell people that you should go for whatever your passion is, but make sure you have something else going on when you start. Because I think, like we were saying before, if you don't, then you can seem like really desperate. And I think that can just spiral out of control. Yeah, absolutely. Or you Mm -hmm. don't want to be going into a pitch or a brand partnership meeting and have that energy your Mm -hmm. yeah having that energy is is really important because ultimately it is a piece of you that is really important that you you just want to show off the best part of it you don't want to have to be like that undercurrent of like I need you to pay me Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know so it's I think it's um something that not a lot of people like talking about but I think it's important for people that are listening so that they can get an idea of how to get on their feet you know in the beginning because that is definitely the hardest part and I think when people think about it um, they don't start their stuff or they see it as on a pedestal or in the future Um, and money is definitely like one of the biggest factors in why they're not going to put that passion out there so I just want people to have some tools Mm -hmm. to maybe think about I think also once you start establishing whatever the brand is more you should just set set it up so that when you do send an email or do send the picture very clear that whatever like whatever I'm going to tell you costs x amount so people aren't blind people do not like to be blindsided Mm -hmm. or like all of a sudden have a great conversation and someone comes in later like their agent or team is like oh by the way it's this amount for what you talked about for an hour and mm-hmm. you're, you don't even know that's happening um so just setting up setting it up early and going into it with the business mind and just saying like um i'm so excited to be working with you on this this is what i charge this is what i think we could do together let me know if you'd like to move forward mm-hmm. for michelle and sherry when you were setting up Um, you said you cut the price of acupuncture in half for New York like how did that factor how were you able to do that I guess I mean was that difficult when thinking about all of your products and services so that it could be really accessible so in all the research that we were doing in terms of what were the barriers and why were there so few people that had tried acupuncture to this point price point ended up being one of the most important ones so we knew kind of from the beginning that we had to figure out a way to make it accessible on a regular basis Mm -hmm. um so you know that helped us really i think once we kind of had that clarity it helped us really define our overall business model and strategy and like Mm -hmm. we really wanted to work everything out around that um but what we actually did, and it's funny because sometimes um, some people on our th- on our team think of it as kind of a trade secret, but um, it's it's not necessarily. But um, the way that we were able to do it was really going back to kind of the roots of acupuncture, which if you look at the East and in China in particular, acupuncture is their first line of defense, their mm. main system of healthcare, and. Um, you know they think about health they completely flip it on their head from what we do so and well yes and thinking of it as preventative so i think Mm -hmm. the easiest way to explain it is that in china historically you would pay your doctor while you're healthy and the minute that you got sick you stop paying until you're healthy again so it's literally the reverse Mm -hmm. of the healthcare system Um, but the way that you know it is so ubiquitous is that Um, and acupuncturists can treat many patients in an hour Mm. Um, and so at within we are able to see multiple clients in an hour acupuncture is different than a massage or a facial in the sense that the treatment only takes a few minutes to 
put the needles in and then the majority of the treatment is relaxing on the table um, with the needles in. In our case, we have heated tables, mm. custom oh, sound I've been. meditations. It is fabulous. <laughs> we I try to like make it an experience. Next time um, we'll do just everyone will be everyone on will their own be heated, heated table. for the podcast. <laughs> um, and so, you know, kind of through that, that was how we're able to bring down the price point. Um, but for us, it was really important to balance the amount of time so that there was still a relationship and time for a conversation. Um, and so that's kind of how we came to being able to cut down the price point while extremely elevating the experience relative to what was available in the market. Nice. Yeah. It's amazing. Do you feel like it was hard um, to get those pitches in the first place? Or did you feel like you had a large enough network to sort of reach out and just start pitching? You said you guys did like Hundreds. 175 or... <laughs> We, sure. we were definitely networking like crazy. Yeah. yeah and yeah. just, um, yeah, throwing paint at the wall, you yeah. know, asking everybody, who do you know? Who do you know? You mm-hmm. know? People we'd meet on the street. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I yep. get it. Hey, I mean, in New York City, you can meet yep. the best Here, people. Someone At one point on the yeah. show was looking through somebody else's LinkedIn. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> perfect. You know. Yeah, like, you, you got to follow. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. that's really you know, smart. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You got to be, you got to be like part sleuth. You know, mm-hmm. part like, oh, I just happy to meet you. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. You also have to have no shame. No like, shame. You can't. If you yeah. want to run a biz like your own brand, you just have to be like, I have no shame. I'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. You like print Legally, it on your forehead. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Around. Yeah. You like yeah. have it on your the moms with mm-hmm. the on the side of their van, just like. Um, okay. I actually, um, so I was reading an interview on the two of you when I was doing my research. <laughs> okay. Hashtag Virgo. Um, the, I was really intrigued by your all's, um, use of oils and herbs and CBD supplements. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that you use that as a daily routine? You said like preventative Chinese medicine. Is it, do you do it every morning, every night? What is your kind of supplement oils, all that, all the things. What is your wellness routine? Sure. So um, first off, acupuncture and herbs have always been used in conjunction, and they're both Mm. um, a rudimentary part of Chinese medicine. So we have our own line of organic herbal formulas, and we're really the first people in the space doing organic Chinese herbs, testing for metals, Mm. testing for microbes, this sort of thing. And acupuncture a lot of people come to acupuncture like Michelle did with a, a primary complaint, you know, neck pain, something like that. But even after you get better, it's something that you want to use preventatively to keep you well. It boosts the immune system, it, it balances hormone levels, helps with your sleep, your digestion, your stress level, this sort of thing. And we really see acupuncture as something that you're ideally doing every week and minimally once a month. And the herbs are a treatment every day. So taking your herbs first thing in the morning, whether it's for energy, for stress, for immunity, taking it at night if you need help sleeping, taking them for a cold, this sort of thing. Uh, herbal medicine is really nature's medicine cabinet. You know, So one of the things we're really promoting it within is for people to have their home apothecary with the remedies that they need I to get through. I love that. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. We're gonna have an apothecary room. <laughs> <laughs> What's the um, the thing that I was reading was that you put oil on your feet for, to go to sleep? Oh, that's really, that's a great practice, especially for little kids, what's too. The you know, like to put cor- like chamomile or something like that on the their feet. What's the correlation between, the, is it like reflexology or what's, wouldn't you put it not on your feet? It, it, <laughs> so, so you really want to ground your energy mm. so you can slow down and come out of your head. So that's why it's great to put it on the feet. Oh my gosh, I yeah. love that. I like to mix head, temples, and feet. Um, what do you put on your temples? I always put the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Katie, I need your beauty routine. Oh gosh, my beauty routine is very extensive. Um, okay, you don't have to give all <laughs> you know, what, to what about, okay, beauty is a broad term. What about, what about, your yeah, I'm like telling you my serum. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to. Say, um, but like, uh, well, like my nighttime. Yeah, routine. yeah, okay. Yeah. So I 
actually use this amazing cleansing oil. I've like really tried to transition as many products as I can into clean beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not for all of them. I don't like I, I hate when I even talk about it because then everyone's like, oh my gosh, then you didn't use a clean product. I'm like, no, I never said I was like the queen of clean beauty. I just said I'm trying to transition. Mm-hmm. And I think there's also a really big mis I don't know if the word is like miscommunication or misconception on the words clean beauty because the word clean is very different than the word non-toxic which is very a completely different category than vegan or cruelty free Mm -hmm. and I think that when it comes to food groups and food ingredients everyone knows when you now you go to a supermarket you turn around a bar and you know exactly what the ingredients mean and what goes into something we didn't know that 10 years ago and currently people don't know or maybe you do know but I didn't know what different ingredients were in different beauty products which made them clean versus non-clean and I think it's still really confusing because it's like it's like throwing out the word um like Pret says they're natural what does that even mean it means nothing Mm -hmm. it's just a marketing term that people deemed their word and natural doesn't mean organic it doesn't mean um grass fed in any way it's just a a word and I think um there's so many products out there that have gone in the cleaner more non-toxic direction but that doesn't necessarily mean they work as well and I think it's really hard to decipher which products to use because maybe they're better for your skin which is like your biggest organ or am I just lathering oils on that aren't actually doing anything for me Mm -hmm. and spending a lot of money so I always tell people like don't start throwing out all your products because they're not necessarily clean they might actually work a lot better and vegan also doesn't mean like I I thought that that was also the most interesting to me I'm like why would a product be vegan like I'm not eating it Mm -hmm. but it's really like what the products are made of so most red lipsticks or red glosses are made from beetles and any beauty brand that's that's calling themselves vegan is using other things but those things might be more toxic exactly Mm -hmm. so I think um the I like always said like I wish I had a cooking show for beauty products Mm -hmm. like putting the ingredients in bowls you can actually our next thing yeah because I think it's I'm idea. very visual like so with food like I like to see what's going in it. I'm like okay I don't know what talc means like what in the within beauty like I wish I could see what that means and know why it's bad or like what does what is a sulfate mm-hmm. you know like everyone's like oh we were sulfate free but like why what's is that paraben? necessarily good or bad yeah. we don't know we just say sulfate free because we think it's good yeah um so I think there's still a lot of room for growth and I know anything I like say or touch like people always have a comment so I'm really careful about what I'm like sharing on my platforms Mm -hmm. but I do really try to use as many clean products that I think work as possible and there's still ones like even for my household I like cleaning cleaning products yeah Yeah. I started transitioning a lot to like these non-toxic products because I was like oh my god I have to clear out everything that's toxic (laughs) my Windex is gone everything is gone and then I didn't find the products that I actually like that work so I'm like oh my gosh now my apartment's so messy (laughs) Messy and dirty (laughs) but at least I looked right (laughs) you're trying to do shoots in there yeah yeah um so I think there's still a big transition but I try to always mind going back to your original question I try to you know take off my makeup or my glam whatever it is for the day I try to have like be super clean I always shower before bed I think it's like part of living in New York City I'm like this I love the the subway so I take the subway everywhere and I think I'm like always like oh I need to wash everything my hair touched the subway like everything touched the subway and um I try to read I mean that's so hard there's always a show I'm trying to binge watch so I'm trying to read before bed instead of like I finished you the crown like I can I'm like out of control right now (laughs) same I'm in the middle of finishing you right now which Scott's like yeah the energy in here is bad again are you watching yeah it's honestly are you watching that show I have such bad dreams when I watch you sorry that I'm such a vessel for energy it's like I think it feels fine in here and he's like no he's like going around with sage I'm like sorry he's like the dog doesn't like when you watch this show I'm like Yes, she does. Um, (laughs) What are some other sort of um, 
I guess metaphysical might be the word, but spiritual metaphysical practices that you guys have. I think when we take care of our bodies, it is a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Um, That sort of ritual of skincare, of um, using herbs and things. And we've talked a lot about preventative um, medicine, wellness. And to me, it's very much, it's very personal and taking care of like this human suit that I've been given is important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but what are some other things that you guys do besides staging your house that you find is a really spiritual practice for you? I mean, I could give a lot of the typical answers of you know meditation and this sort of thing, which I'm a huge fan mm-hmm. of. But the first thing that comes to mind right now is spending time with my daughter. That is a spiritual practice. That's beautiful. It brings me into the moment. It um, snaps me out of work. It snaps me out of my world and into the world of a beautiful child. Yeah. She took mine. (laughs) (laughs) Damn, I should have gone first. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, I would like, I would say 100% spending time with my son Sam, who's two, and I think, you know, there was a period when I was first kind of balancing being a mom and Mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur where I would let, you know, I would have my phone and respond to emails or like be thinking about work. So I always try to like, even before I walk in the door, like just take a moment Mm -hmm. to like decompress and like shift my mindset. And Mm -hmm. now I don't look at my phone anymore for that like hour and a half before he goes to bed. And I like really value that time. And I think it's also bedtime and then also in the mornings we're able to have a lot of quality time as well. Um, And then I think, yeah, for me, it's all about, there's nothing like more joyful than a two year old. So I think it's really just shifting that energy and just that happiness and like pure And seeing how they experience the world again. Looking at things through their their eyes. Exactly. Who knew that a backhoe digging a hole on the street was the most amazing thing <laughs> was a spiritual made. practice yeah. you know like before it's like yeah smelly it's like right. oh. that's yeah. great what about you Katie? um i think um there was like about i am um, i'd say like two years ago i started feeling like really emotionally unfulfilled because mm-hmm. i was spending so much time on myself mm-hmm. um And I do really think it's important to be successful to invest in yourself in a lot of ways. But I think we live in a world that we're so like all about me, me, me. Mm -hmm. And I have a brand that like is about me and all this stuff. And it started Mm -hmm. really freaking me out. I'm like, oh my God, like this is, I need to get out of this bubble. Yeah, It's not healthy. And I um, joined... I started working with Make-A-Wish and Mm -hmm. which kind of like brought me in the complete opposite direction for obvious reasons, but I, at first it was too much because it was like so super emotional on mm-hmm. that end and not, and about someone like that I didn't even know and I was getting extremely emotional about their story um, that it took a little while for me to balance the two because like they were so different. And I think just getting involved with things that have nothing to do with your work, your friendships your relationships that are all about focusing your energy on other people and helping other people um I think everyone should be doing it and I know that I have so many people that reach out to me and they're like well how do we even start like how do we get involved for different philanthropies like it seems like you have to give money and there are so many ways to get involved in other things and volunteer your time that I think a lot of people don't realize there's so much that can that is needed with volunteers for like their physical time and like on the weekend after work and just getting involved doing something that has nothing to do with yourself. Oh, that's beautiful. I was about to cry there, but I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so this is sort of concluding our hour-long podcast and I wanted to tell all uh, all of you about your Signs, oh, your sun signs. So I've been your... like so excited for this. Since She's you like, told I'm waiting. I'm, waiting. I'm ready. So I was, I was originally planning to do um, <laughs> your all's full birth charts. So I'll have to email those to you guys later because I got busy with the podcast. <laughs> um, but we have a Virgo and two Scorpios. I'm also a Virgo, which means we have Virgo, Scorpio, Virgo, Scorpio. So that was unplanned. That is beautiful Mm -hmm. and how the universe works because it's like clearly you guys are a wonderful team. 
Katie and I are going to be a wonderful team. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but Scorpios, um, you guys are a water sign. I'm sure. Do you know anything about it? No. Yes, Ooh, sure. yay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Scorpio um, is a water sign and it is one of the more intense water signs. So your um, emotions run really, really deep. And if you have a hard time um, looking those in the face and sort of acknowledging them and honoring them, um, you can get kind of twisted up. And so it's probably right when you were saying that about the Make-A-Wish, um, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, it's because she's a Scorpio. Like you, you embody other people's emotions mm -hmm. very easily, which is a gift, but it's hard to let that live in your body and also not identify with it as your own. Um, it's a new moon today, which um, is also an Aquarius. And a new moon sets up um, an energy for six months. So any sort of intention that you set, if you do a new moon ritual or light a candle or meditate and think about the intention that you want, um, it's sort of like a, planting a little seed and then you get to see it grow over the next six months. And if you haven't ever done a new moon ritual or any kind of ritual like that, it still happens, right? Like you still have intentions every day that you're putting forth. And so um, for Scorpios, the um, for this new moon ritual is that you need to create a space a sacred space at home and it needs to be a place where you feel like you can come back to and ground yourself because you're always doing a lot for other people and it needs to be like your center mm -hmm. and then for Virgos for us um, it's actually a lot about our daily routine for this intention for this next six months that we can kind of get overload our plate too much and that it needs to be something that is purposeful and small steps towards our goal instead of continuing to try to do too much and sort of organize making it you know we're good at organizing but sometimes that can be a little overkill so making it purposeful organization yeah, oh, and, and being a Virgo, we're earth signs. Um, and so anything, like you said, with being grounded, doing the oil on the feet is something that's like so Virgo, it's crazy. Um, I'm trying it tonight. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think that concludes our Hippie in the City podcast. Thank you guys so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom and your hearts and your souls with me. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. us. Thank you so, so much. fun to do a live <laughs> podcast. And like congrats. congrats. If you love our podcast as much as we love you, please subscribe. Spotify, you can hit the follow button. And on Apple Podcasts, you can click the three dots on the right and click subscribe. Because numbers matter, people. We live in the matrix. Also, if you'd like to support us so we can aim to run ad-free episodes, go to anchor.fm slash l dash army slash support. That's A-N-C-H-O-R dot F-M slash E-L-L-E dash A-R-M-Y slash S-U-P-P-O-R-T. Peace and love.